So we're just about ready to start. And um, this first slide is about the big guys caring about copyright. And in this particular incident in Florida, there were three daycare centers where they had pictures of Mickey Mouse and characters from Disney on their daycares. And they were for profit daycares. And Disney actually came after them about using their um, copyrighted uh, images to maybe help them with their business. So even the big guys are looking at all the time, everywhere. So in 1992, a graphic artist was inspired by Bill Clinton's bluesy saxophone performance on the Arsenio Hall show. So he decided to design a, a t-shirt and button that he could use to help raise money for Habitat for Humanity. After he designed, he learned that, uh, that the Clinton Gore, the official Clinton Gore store in, in Little Rock was selling, had copied the design and was selling knockoffs out of their store. So he approached them and threatened to sue if they didn't stop. And so this time the little guy was able to successfully get the, the, the copyright offender to stop. My, I'm Doug Dunbevin. I work at RETN Channel 16 here in, in the Champlain Valley. We are the Champlain Valley's education station. And we love to showcase the work that students and, and, and educators create in their own schools and in the classrooms. And as you can imagine, because we love to do that and because we are a business um, who does have somewhat deeper pockets than an individual would have, you can understand why copyright would be extremely important to us. But we also hope to share with you a little bit today why we hope it'd be important to you as well. And I'm Kathy Heavey, and I teach sixth grade at Hunt Middle School. And my students are constantly producing work that is leaving the classroom. The classroom of the past, of having everything on the walls on these neat little bulletin boards is over. And we want that, that medium to be able to go out so people can see that. So my students are constantly producing things. And as a result of that, they, we've learned that we really need to be careful about copyright. And so this year, we've really done a lot of work on making sure things are legal and especially because we like to put things on the RETN website and television so students have really started to take a, a real vested interest in making sure their things are copyright free. Oh, so, so who cares about copyright? It's one of the, the W's and one thing is I think is everyone should care about copyright and so I pose that question to my students so you can take a look. Who should care about copyright? What do you think? Copyright is something you use when you don't want people to abuse your work. The reason people should care about copyright is because if creators know the work is protected they will share more of it which gives more inspiration to the users looking at the work. Creators use copyright, they'll share more ideas, and then the users can use the ideas for inspiration of their own work. The reason why I think copyright is important is that if someone does not ask permission to use a document, picture, or a presentation, the person that created, created those things would not get any credit. Users care about copyright because when creators are protected, they share more. Users should care about copyright, because without copyright, some people who create work would be discouraged to share it, then there wouldn't be as much inspiration for the people to use. Users have to make sure what type of copyright is on the other people's work. Users should care about copyright, because if they don't, they can get in trouble with the law. The creators of a piece of work should care about copyright because they don't want their work stolen. Creators want to share their work with you, but they don't want you to take credit for it. Creators should care because it allows them to be more collaborative with others. Creators should care because they probably would want recognition for their work, and they wouldn't want it to be used in a bad way. So just to let you know, that was videotaped by one of my students. So the, the jumpiness, that's not an RETN thing. That's a, that's a middle school student thing. It's the eloquence of the answers that I thought were impressive. Yeah. It's, it's very impressive. They're, they're great kids. Um, so, so being 
the local education station. We obviously love to get out into forums like this and share a little bit about different areas, video recording as well as uh, uh, copyright. Um, one of the things we've also done is made available on our website, and you'll notice the handout that we gave you. Uh, uh, there are a lot of links to different resources, and we have on our website, if you go to retn.org slash copyright, you can find uh, links to pretty much everything that we will show you today. Um, the videos of the students, we haven't gotten up there yet, but as far as the, the materials. So I think this is helpful, especially since, as I mentioned earlier, we do have uh, local channel 16, but we also on our, have a website where we host video. So as you become, as you start putting your content in a bigger and bigger audience, copyright becomes even more critical. So being a television channel, that's really important. And now that we're doing the internet, it becomes even more important. So um, we'd love to point you to those resources and feel free to look at those. Um, I should also mention that neither Kathy or I, or I are, are, are attorneys. We're not <laughs> lawyers. Um, so what we're telling you today is based on our research and, and, and the information we've read about. Um, but ultimately, in all of these decisions, um, it's, it's a judge who will make the final decision as to whether something is copyright, uh, wh whether what you've done is appropriate or not. Um, but what we thought we would do is start by having at least a basic explanation of what copyright is. So the second of the five W's of copyright that we'd like to talk about is what is copyright? And to do that, we found a great organization called uh, the Copyright Center. Um, they actually created this video, and with their permission, we are, we are showing what copyright is. Hey, Jim, thanks for that report you gave me the other day. My client loved it. You gave it to your client? No. Oh. I made a copy for him. We have a limited subscription to those reports. You can't copy them or distribute them without permission. Really? Yeah. Geez. Next thing I know, you'll be posting stuff like that to the web and emailing it all over the place. We're not supposed to do that either? No. No? Yeah. Yeah? No. Intellectual property like published reports, articles, and content you find on the web has to be managed carefully. We have to balance its use with our rights, licenses, and copyright requirements. I know. I read our copyright policy when I joined the company. Good. That's a start. But it really comes down to what we do on a daily basis. If you have a few minutes, I can explain the basics of copyright to you. Okay. Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution gives Congress the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing, for limited times, to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. It means that in the United States, a copyright holder has some exclusive rights to his or her work. And those rights are protected by U.S. copyright law. Oh, I, I always thought no copyright symbol, no problem. Nope. Copyright is automatic. As soon as something is captured in a fixed format, such as being written down or recorded, it is protected by copyright. Neither registration or publication are required, nor is the use of the copyright symbol. Although, it's a good idea to use the copyright symbol as it reminds people that the work is protected by copyright. So what are the copyright holders' rights? Copyright holders have the exclusive right to copy, distribute, perform, and display their work, and the right to create a derivative work like when a book is made into a movie. This is why you may need permission if you want to email a research report to your project team or a customer, post an article or a report on a company wiki or an internet site, reprint articles in the company newsletter, post a news story about our company on our website, or make a photocopy of a newspaper article to hand out at a meeting. Really? For everything? Well, a lot of things, such as books, magazine and online articles, songs, screenplays, choreography, photos, artwork, podcasts, and software. They're all protected by copyright. But not everything. Ideas, facts, and data are not protected by copyright law. Logos and taglines aren't either, although they might be protected by trademark law. Anything created by the U.S. government is not covered by copyright law. Uh, neither are works for which the copyright has expired. But what about fair use? If it's for our research, doesn't fair use mean I can use the material? Maybe. Fair use recognizes that certain uses of the copyright-protected work do not require permission from the copyright holder. Fair use allows for the use of the copyright-protected work for commentary, parody, news reporting, research, and education. The U.S. Copyright Act lists four factors to help determine when a use may be considered fair use. The first is the purpose and character of the use. If the use is intended to help derive financial or other business benefit, then it is less likely to be considered fair use. That usually ends the analysis for most business uses. Next is the nature of the copyrighted work. The use of a purely factual work is more likely to be considered fair use than the use of a creative work. Third, an evaluation of the amount and substantiality considers how much of the work was used. Even a small portion may be too much to qualify as fair use if what is used is the heart of the work. And
And finally, fair use considers the effect of the use on the market or the potential market. If your use is likely to result in economic loss to the copyright holder, then it is less likely to be considered fair use. None of these factors alone is enough to determine fair use. You have to weigh all four in order to determine if the use is really fair use. Oh. This stuff is confusing. For example, many people confuse the physical ownership of a book or a CD with owning the copyright to that work. The first sale doctrine permits lending, reselling, disposing, etc. of the item, but it does not permit reproducing the material, performing it, or any of the copyright holder's other exclusive rights. Attribution is another area of confusion. People think if they just cite their source, they're good to go. But attribution is not a substitute for copyright permission. If the work is protected by copyright, you must obtain permission from the copyright holder or their agent in order to use it. And lots of people confuse the legal concept of the public domain with the fact that a work may be publicly available, such as information found in books or on the internet. The public domain comprises all those works that are either no longer protected by copyright or never were. Oh, I see. Most people do not intentionally violate copyright law. Like you, they are simply unaware of their responsibilities as they go about their everyday activities, which often involve the use and distribution of published information. Is this a big problem? Imagine millions of employees moving billions of documents around the world with no idea what their copyright responsibilities are. It kills me. I guess it is a big problem. But does it really matter? I mean, who's going to know? It matters for many reasons. First and foremost, it's the law. It's unlawful to infringe on the rights of copyright holders. They can sue for damages or to recoup lost profits as a result of infringement, which is costly and, well, it looks bad for the company. It's also a matter of ethics. Demonstrating respect for the rights of copyright holders is simply the right thing to do. When we generate intellectual property, we want our rights respected, so we should respect the rights of others. And finally, copyright ensures the continued availability of the high-value material we rely on. Our needs are served by copyright holders' information development, and the royalties we pay fuel further development. Very interesting. So what do we do when we want to use copyrighted information? I'm always here to help, but the best advice I can give you is know the facts, remember your responsibilities, and when in doubt, get permission. So creativity is really important in the classroom and so knowing that copyright exists and that other users or creators are posting things that our kids can use, that allows us to be more creative and, and enhance our work and so having students understand that importance it helps them be more creative and they get excited about even knowing when their things are out there that other people might get ideas and they like to share as well. Um, so Creative Commons is a great um, website that you can use that allows students to get information and get ideas and get pieces of work that they can then incorporate into their work um, if the attributes allow that. And so once again, sometimes videos can be more succinct than us trying to explain what Creative Commons is. So we're going to show you another video that, that explains, it talks a little bit about copyright, but then goes into Creative Commons and, and the benefits to that. Enter one of the Internet's most famous citizens. A face familiar the world over, a public identity rivaled only by a handful of corporate giants and global superstars, the Big Copyright C. Everyone knows what Big C stands for. Big C means all rights reserved. Big C means ask permission. Big C protects copyright owners and notifies the rest of us of their ownership. Time was when you had to put Big C on anything you wanted to copyright or else it entered the public domain, the commons of information where nothing is owned and all is permitted. You had to put the world on notice to warn them. That was Big C's job, and it was a useful one. What changed? The law. By the late 1980s, U.S. law had changed so that works become copyrighted automatically the moment they're made. The moment you hit save on that research paper, the second the shutter snaps closed, the instant you lift your pen from that cocktail napkin doodle, your creation is copyrighted, whether Big C makes a cameo or not. 
So suddenly, there's no quick way of knowing whether something's owned or not. The new rules may be clear about how you get to own a work. You don't have to do anything. But they say nothing at all about how you should go about announcing that you want to allow certain uses of your work. So what? Well, if you're a digital filmmaker whose every frame must be cleared by an army of lawyers before making the cut, or if you're in a band whose label won't let you put a song on a file-sharing network, or if you're a professor trying to put together online course materials, or if you're a DJ chasing down permission to use every snippet of song in your sonic collage, if you're one of these people, then you know, so what? We interrupt this brainstorm to call the lawyers. You drop what you're doing and call all the lawyers. You ask for permission, even to use a work whose author doesn't mind if you use it, because you have no idea what the author's intent is. You ask for permission, even to share some of your rights. Or you venture forward, unsure what your risks and rights are exactly. Or, in a haze of legal doubt, you do nothing. The bottom line? Big C is out of a job. The middlemen are not. Enter Creative Commons. Creative Commons wanted to find an easy way to help people tell the world up front that they want to allow some uses of their work. We called the experts, the U.S. Copyright Office, for advice. Their response? There's no real answer. Get creative. So we got creative. How? Our CC brand marks works that are governed by Creative Commons licenses. A set of standardized copyright licenses available free of charge on our website. We wrote these licenses so that lawyers and courts could read them. Then we translated them into a language you can read. And then we translated them into a language computers can read. Now, CC isn't meant to compete with copyright, but to complement it. It allows you to retain your copyright while granting the world permission to make certain uses of it upon certain conditions. If the big C is like a red light, then CC is a green light. If the big C says no trespassing, the double C says please come in. If the big C says all rights reserved, CC says some rights reserved. So you can use the powers of the net to find works free to share and build upon and to invite other people to transform or trade yours so that you can get creative, not only with what you make, but how you make it available. So you can collaborate across space and time. So you can be a co-author with someone you've never met. So you can stand on the shoulders of your peers. All without asking permission. Because permission has already been granted. Creative Commons. Get creative. It's easy when you skip the intermediaries. that watching these videos with your students is really helpful too and stopping and pausing and having that discussion I think like you were talking about their answers earlier to the what is copyright or they it's because they've gone through this discussion process and if we just tell them they need to protect they need to check copyright so they can use things and they don't totally understand it I don't think they're as vested in it. And so these videos that Doug has picked out are really good ones to show your kids and really have that ethical conversation with them. And I, I think the power of Creative Commons in particular is that it can give you the confidence that you're actually using work appropriately because they've already told you what, what you're able to do with it. Um, you'll notice on the handouts also that we gave you, there are a list of the licenses at the bottom. And there's also a link on there. So if you want to see them at a bigger scale. Um, so it lists the different types of licenses and I will point out now and we repetition sometimes is helpful so you may hear this a couple of times.
but the key, and there are two of them that are highlighted, I believe, and those say no derivatives. And so the key you, as you create, is you want to avoid any license that says no derivatives because that, that means you can't build on it. You can't, they don't want you to take it and use it into your work. So any of the other licenses, there are specifics about how they can be used, whether you can um, have to give attribution, most of them will say that, whether you can use it to make money or whether it's only for non-commercial or to offer the, in the same share and share alike model. Um, but the third W in our five W's is actually when do you need permission? And so that's, as I mentioned, that's the benefit to Creative Commons because if you use content created by someone else, you should always seek permission unless you're certain that you have permission. And Creative Commons gives you that confidence that you do have the permission to use it in the way that you want to use it. It is also important if it is not in the public domain, public domain was mentioned, uh, the nice thing about the public domain is there, there are a number of very useful um, uh, pr items available to you. Um, mm -hmm. If you think about things that are expired copyrights, government documents are in it, um, facts, as they said, cannot be copyrighted. The way that they're presented can be the, the, in terms of the aesthetic look of it. For example, a weather page, you know, you can't copyright the weather, but you can copyright the way that it is displayed, the way you display your graphics. Um, so the, the, the last one is if, you're, if your use fails, the four-part test. Now, I'm just curious, how many people here have actually heard about fair use? Okay, so everyone's kind of used to it, and you obviously heard it in the video. Um, you actually saw in the video that there's a four-part test to fair use. And a lot of times people, had, had you not seen the video already, oftentimes people will say, well, as long as I'm not making money on it, then it's fair use. Or as long as I give credit, or as long as it's a little tiny piece of it, it's fine. And those observations are accurate, but it's only partially right, which is to say that you need to be able to meet the four-part test in order for it to be qualifying as fair use. In fact, most organizations, or mo most organizations who talk about copyright, universities, they oftentimes put out um, uh, brochures or pamphlets about it, websites, they will mention that typically you need you're safest if you have all four parts met. I mean, you can certainly meet, meet one, two, and three, but the more parts that you meet, the safer you are. And once again, only a judge will be able to determine. So just to go over, once again, what those four parts are, number one is the purpose and character of the work. So obviously, if you're doing it for nonprofit, or if you're doing it in a classroom, or if you're doing it um, as part of a commentary, a, a parody on, on something, if it's a parody, um, oftentimes you'll see music that is popular music or video clips from a popular movie in something that is a, a parody and you'll say well how did they get to use it and it's because parody is one of those protected fair use if it's done as in its totality fits the fair use criteria the sec the second part of it is the nature of the work so for example things that are fiction things that are are creative tend to be have str you need to seek permission if you're using those more so than if if it's fact based so the nature of the work is important. The third is the amount. So it is true that if you use a small piece, you're more likely to favor the fact that it's fair use. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it is fair use because it can be a very small piece. But if it's the heart of the piece, as the, as the video pointed out earlier, if it is the, the most recognizable piece, part of that piece, it doesn't matter how big it is. It could be an infringement on, on a copyright and not be considered under fair use. And then the fourth one is the market effect. And oftentimes, once again, people say, as long as I'm not making money on it, then it doesn't affect the market, and so it's perfectly fine. But that's only part of it, because you can actually make money w using copyrighted work. That's not necessarily the case that you can't make money with it, but it just has to be within the context of the four-part fair use. So um, the market effect can also be, if it has absolutely no impact on the market, then obviously that would help you qualify. But if, in fact, you're creating something that will then mean people won't buy the product, that obviously is going to have an impact. And, and, and quite honestly, economic matters are one of the things that the judges look at probably the most. If you're actually costing the copyright holder money, then, then you'll have some problems. So one of the things, can yes? Can, can you go back to that slide? Absolutely. Point, well, I say absolutely, and let's see if we can. <laughs> Because I've got I've got a couple questions. Yes. <clears throat> okay. So um, one, if you are using a video clip, now you're able to use uh, thirty seconds or less. Is that correct? 
No, that's what I was suggesting, is that there is no magic number. There's no magic There's number. There's no magic number. Was there a magic number at one point? Um, I'll tell you what. Can we... Can we come back to the details of this during the Q&A? Okay, Is sure, that sure, okay? sure, sure, sure. Because I think, yeah, yeah, I think yeah, yeah. there may be a multiple questions that a lot of you have. And, okay, and, okay. and what I wanted to explain before I show this slide is that, that the fair use component of this could be a, a seminar all in itself yeah. because there are, there's a lot to it. And what we wanted to do was just kind of give you more of a basic overview. But if there's time, we can try to answer some of the questions. Maybe collectively there'll be people who can help if, if we okay. aren't certain of it. If that's okay? Yeah, sure. Okay, great. And just coming up with those questions, I mean, that's what I found. The more I delved into the copyright stuff, the more questions I had, and I realized how little I did know at the beginning. Um, so I wanted to mention oh, one last thing before we go back to, to Kathy. There, um, on our website, there are links to this as well. This is one of the fair use evaluators. So it does list the four-part use, and it explains um, a little bit about what each of those means, the nature of the work, and uh, et cetera. Okay, so one of the other questions that I ask my students and what we've been working on a lot this year is where can I get content so that they can create their projects and and put them out there because we're not keeping things in the classroom anymore as much as we can how do we know if something has copyright protection have you ever noticed that on CDs videos games and text have a C with a circle around it that is the copyright symbol. It shows that the thing is copyright protected. Files online have attribution details. Some attributions are. Sometimes people say you can't use that at all. Sometimes they say you can't use it commercially. Sometimes you can use it without any restrictions. Some people say you can use it for whatever you want. No matter what, if you use someone else's work, you should give them credit for it. If you make it, you own it. Here are some of the ways to get copyright free material. Make your own drawing. I made my own for a photo story. Take your own photo. I took a picture of my saxophone for a school project. Write and record your own music using GarageBand or Sibelius. A few websites where you can get copyright free material are Flickr and Jamenda. Creative Commons has a lot of options and a good place to find it is RATM website. If you use iMovie, the music on there is free for use. So that's a clip of GarageBand. Has anybody in here used GarageBand? Yeah. And one of my students mentioned about also using Sibelius. Do many of your schools do that? So I've been working really hard this year with our music teacher to try and create something on the school drive where when these kids are producing these nice little pieces for music class, that we could actually go in there and get those pieces to help us with our, with our projects. So we have some resources there that we just need to start figuring out a way to network them with each other. What's kind of nice too is so much of the equipment is already freely available. We had a camera in the back I was going to, uh, to show you, the dig digital camera. So, so oh, yeah. we're creating content oh, yeah. today for ourselves, for yeah. RETN. Um, Scott, our executive director in the back, he has been taking some pictures of this. So the tools are there and, and so when it, why not teach the kids to create their own content? Um, but every April 15th I am reminded of yet another great source for free content and that's the government. I pay my taxes. It's, it's the government of the people, but it's also a government paid for by the people. So because we pay for this, things that are on government websites that are created by the government are free for us to use. They're in the public domain. So just to give you some ideas, you'd say you're doing a project where you're talking about the military and you need a great picture or a video of a military airplane, try one of the, uh, the Defense Department's websites. Or say you want to get a picture of President Obama or a previous president, try the, the whitehouse.gov website. Or say you want to get something, you're doing something in space discovery. How about NASA? Some incredibly HD, beautiful videos. For the final launch of Endeavor, expanding our knowledge, expanding our lives in space. I mean, a little bit of this snippet of this at the beginning of one of your, your videos about discovery of space or the history of space could be beautiful. And it's free, and you can download it from their website. And all of the NASA apps are free, too, that have the beautiful HD pictures. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Good tip. Um, so, the other, another uh, place that is available, items in the public domain that are not just government websites, 
and uh, those items tend to be things that are um, older. They um, something say you have a, an illustration from the 1800s. The copyright has probably expired on that since the person who's living who, who created it is is no longer alive, and uh, and so the copyright would have expired. That would be in the public domain for you. An old photograph here is as pictured. A great tool that I want to point out to you, and once again is available on our website as well as on the handout that we gave you, was created by Michael Brewer, and he does ask, as you notice on the Creative Commons license, for credit attribution whenever uh, you, you use this uh, tool that he's created with the ALA office, American Library Association office, for information technology policy. It's a digital slider that allows you to, it gives you a sense of how far back you can go to find out if, if copyright, uh, w whether it's in the public domain or not. And you would simply uh, uh, see what the date is of the, the work you're looking at and slide that orange bar up and down. And, and, and in the left-hand side, you'll see no permission needed, copyright status in public domain. That changes depending on the date. So you do need to know something about the work that you're trying to get, at least the, 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 the idea of when it was created. And the fourth way that we would suggest is? Yeah, is using the Creative Commons website. And I have to say, my students are, have gotten really skilled with using this site this year. So even, basically, I just sort of started with them. And then I'm actually the type of teacher where once I get a few kids hooked on something, they know how to do it. It's like, they'll come, Mrs. Heavey, I don't know how to do this. And then I'll, I'll say, go ask uh, so-and-so, or who's good at Creative Commons? And their hands will go up, and they help each other. So even as teachers, we don't have to master it. We need to know how to do it. We need to know how to get them started. But then let your kids help each other because then you're not spending all your time when this one student doesn't know how to find a piece. Like, I can't find something on a saxophone or something. So you can send them and really get them to go in and, and do some searches and find some stuff. So, so is, how many here have actually used Creative Commons Search before? Yeah, a lot of so people. there are a few who haven't. Mm -hmm. um, I think Kathy is willing to do a, a quick demonstration just so you get get an understanding of how easy and how, how quick and easy it can be. So let's go ahead and click on the graphic to take us to the website. And you'll have to pardon us because of the screen. It's sometimes, well, actually, everything does fit onto the screen. It's when like the resolution is the way it is, sometimes you, the real estate gets kind of uh, squeezed out. So, so Kathy, go ahead. I'll let you know. OK, so right here, this is the important part, this use for commercial purposes and modify, adapt, or build on. And so oftentimes, we, we're unclicking that. And then, um, for instance, my students were doing something on the Amazon rainforest, which always makes me nervous to type in. Um, and if they were looking for a picture, we could go to Flickr. And then they would look through and find a picture that they thought maybe, maybe was something that they um, thought, well, this might work with my particular project. So what they would do is click on that. And then if you scroll down, you can read. Oh, yeah, it is over there. You can see that the license says some rights reserved. So we click on that. Oh, just happened. Let's try again. This will work this time. I've been having some issues to try to yeah. get on different sites saying that I can't mm. connect. Okay. So, so I don't know if the, this room is that. It could be. And this, this go ahead, you explain what, we, yeah, what so, you would see in this site. Yeah, so at the bottom, and the students know to do this too. So they, and they were the ones that were the quickest to figure that out, like, and find out, well not, after I had showed it, I kind of forgot. And they'd be like, no, no, we click here. And so we help each other go through this process. And when we get stuck, we ask people that can help us. And so at the bottom there, it will tell us that you can build upon this and use it. And, and, um, and that particular picture, you know, we would look through to see if it says, no, you can't change it, or yes, you can. Just make sure you give me credit. And the students learn those, those um, attributes so that they can then figure out whether or not it's OK. Because just because it's on Creative Commons, doesn't mean you can necessarily change it, but it really, there's a lot out there that you can use. So it's a great way to do that. Uh, uh, very similar to the Flickr that you noticed, you'll notice on Creative Commons there's also a link to Jamendo, which is one of, I believe, many uh, sites that, that feature music. So music is one of the biggest problems for kids. They tend to like to choose the most popular music that's out there. And so Jamendo gives an option 
where you can search for music. It's not going to be the most <coughs> popular music, the well-known music, but it could be a similar genre if you're using the background music. And so it's very similar kind of a search uh, environment. And if, if Kathy's had some experience with it, we may have technical problems with yeah, that as well. Yeah, let's see today, what happens here. So see, it gives you the different genres right there. And that's one thing, if you're using movies with kids, that's probably why you're looking for some music. <laughs> And music just enhances the movies, but it has to match what's going into their movie. One year we did some uh, Mother's Day photo stories. We were doing a biography unit and we brought in some pictures and they wanted like rap music in the background because they love rap. And it's like, you gotta think about who's this presentation for? Does your mom like rap? If she does, then that would be really nice to play in the background with all your pictures of yourself growing up. But if your mom doesn't like rap, that's probably not the right mood. Since, since we're running, I want to leave time for questions and answer too. Why don't we, if we come back okay. to the search, if you guys are interested later, okay. we, we'd be happy to do that. But let me come back to our uh, final movie because I want to make sure that oh. we get to see. You're right, that time, weren't you? <laughs> we get to see that one as well. And it's, uh, I'll let Kathy introduce that one. Yeah, so the other question I ask my students is why should we care about copyright? And so. People should care about copyright because it is a right and respectful thing to do. People should care about copyright because if you don't, then it's kind of like not caring if you cheat on a test. You're using somebody else's work, and when you do that, they should have credit too. Because it can hurt the other's feelings. People should care about copyright because it's a law and it should be followed. People should care because somebody might not want somebody to build or adapt on their work. People should care about copyright law because the internet is a global community. People should care about copyright because some um, person who made something that you're using is going to want credit, but if you're taking the credit, they're going to be upset. People should care about copyright so people can't steal other people's work. People should care about copyright because um, other people want credit for their work. People should care about copyright laws because it's wrong not to. People should care because it's the right thing and respectful thing to do. So why should Mrs. Heavey's class care about copyright laws? I think our class should care about copyright laws a lot because we use the internet like every single day and we use a lot of photos from it. We should care because sometimes when we make movies for RETN, we use photos and we have to make sure those are copyright free. Our class should care about copyright because we use a lot of things off the internet for posters. Our class should care about copyright because we use music and photos and videos and we should make sure that those aren't copyrighted because if they are, then we would be breaking the law. Because we love having our work put on RETN. <laughs> A little shameless self-promotion, but actually that was Kathy's idea. She, she said, you're, you're going to laugh when you see the last part of it, and I did, i got to say, it was, they, it's really cute. But they mean it. That, that was for them, I think, really the catalyst for taking ownership and trying to find out about copyright. We always teach them that. We teach them about plagiarism, too. And, and so for me, the fact that it's like, we can't give this to RETN if it's not if it's not you know okay and so we have to make sure that we're looking at that and one person does something wrong and we put a whole movie together we won't be able to use that movie so we've had a lot of discussion about it and they've taken ownership of that and really it's made it easier for me to try they, they're documenting you know those bibliographies where we want them to this is easy what page should we be pasting these uh, you know URLs in and they're really trying harder to paste URLs because they understand the importance better. So that front-loaded discussion about copyright, I think, is so important because we just tell them copyright's important, or or if we're telling them, it you know, well, it's just staying here, or it's all right, don't worry about copyright. We wouldn't model, we wouldn't model stealing or cheating or that kind of thing. And so, at the very least, we should try to model those right things to do. I don't mean we'll get them right. I don't think I get everything right, but when I'm really stuck, I. I'm lucky enough to be able to contact Doug at RETN, and he's given me a hand in our librarian as well. The, our librarians in our schools are great about this. So, you know, we just need to start making the effort. But once we make the kids care, they'll almost push us to care because they kind of push us about, do you think this is copyright free? And now that we're having that discussion, now I'm locked in and I can't just overlook it. I have to make sure that it's okay. So I think it's been a really great year for them understanding copyright and how that's really gonna help them as lifelong learners.
So thank you for listening to ours. And now we'd like to open it up for questions. I know there are some questions okay. here. And uh, if you want to start with the first one and, and others, if you have others. Sure. Um, I took an online course in, uh, a while back. And we spent a little bit of time, probably about a week, on copyright. Mm -hmm. And so what I got out of that is that, uh, first off, there's a, there's um, some of this is concrete. We know, you know that some of this is fair use, but a lot of this seems kind of nebulous and um, you know, there is different information, different documents that you can find on what is, you know, what's allowable and what is not allowable. So the, you know, going to that question that I had for you earlier, you know, I had a document that suggested that you could use less than 30 seconds of a piece of music or less than 30 seconds of a video. Uh, now, I don't know if that's correct, um, and I guess it just, it, it depends on the video and whether or not it's like, you know, a pivotal, pivotal, a pivotal part of the movie or, you know, uh, of, the, of, the, of the piece of music. It, that, so that's, that's correct. I mean, yeah. so you can't use like um, the chorus in a song possibly because it's so well known. I, I would always, like I said, to be safe, I would always ask permission, seek permission whenever you can. I mean, okay. that, that's the safest way to do anything. As long as you know who the copyright holder is, it's, it should be fairly easy to ask the question. You may not always get the answer you want, okay. but you can always ask the question. So that's the first thing I would always say is look for permission. Okay. Um, but as far as that little snippet or 30 second rule, um, a good person to check with would be Shannon Walter. She <coughs> did a presentation yesterday that I went to, and in there she mentioned the libraries used to have a sign up with there had been a meeting, I think, among a lot of people in the industries affected by, co you know, the, the entertainment industries, the movie industries, the music industry, and there had been some agreement at a, a point that said, here are some guidelines, here are some ways that you can use it. But, but that guideline is not necessarily a legal document. Yeah. And so what they are finding is that there have been cases, as I understand, there have been cases where people have used very, very, very small, let, followed the guidelines, but then been sued because of the fact that it infringed on the copyright. So that's why I'm saying, there is no safe amount. Okay, don't okay. don't think in terms of there are some safe amounts. Look at the four-part test in its totality. Do due diligence. If you can document for, if, if you ever get confronted and you can show that you've done due diligence in looking at the four-part test, used critical thinking, which I think the next session is going to talk a little bit about critical thinking. Critical thinking is what we're trying to shift people more towards, is saying, mm -hmm. let me look at the four-part test, let me determine and evaluate to the best of my ability whether in fact it is fair use. Um, and then now that we know that there are alternatives through Creative Commons, let me look for alternatives if I have a doubt. Uh, we can come back to okay. you. Well, it's in response okay, to this. Sure. Um, I teach technology. We actually teach the same school. But um, in my classes where we talk about copyright, we spend a lot of time on fair use because, it's, because it is very nebulous. But the main thing that I try to stress is the law states that fair use is not a right, it is a privilege. And the, the fair use clause is merely a legal defensible position should you be sued, but it is not your right to use anything that is copyrighted. It's, it's a very nebulous hedging of the law. Yeah. And so you have to be very careful. And the whole thing about the 30 seconds or whatever it is, well, the, the, the guidelines, and they're only guidelines, state that you know it is the proportion relative to the whole and the nature of what you're using. Um, so I mean, 30 seconds, well, if it's a 60 second thing, you're using 50% of it. If you um, if it's a mystery something and you give away the, the, the solution, that's probably not okay. Um, so those guidelines are really strictly guidelines. And I stress over and over again that it is a privilege and not a right. And, and that's why we've geared a lot towards trying to create our own content versus, you know, I mean, we've been more creative with that so that we're not having those kinds of issues. But I would say schools, a lot of schools, we're still having issues with not the nebulous areas, but we're still having issues with our students with things that are very concrete and clear, and we're overlooking those. So, yeah, that, and that's where I'll go to Doug with some of those that I'm really unclear about, 
but there are a lot of a lot of us that are using things and we're just kind of thinking well we're under the umbrella of education it's okay and that's where we can start making some shifts and then worry about those little gray areas or big gray areas so a little bit more but let's take care of the real concrete ones first and if I can real quick just um what you're just asking about are the legal aspects, the reasons why you would right. follow copyright law. What we wanted to emphasize towards the end especially was there's the whole ethical end yeah. of the spectrum too, mm -hmm. which yeah. is what do you want to model for your students? Right. Do you want to model to them that it's okay to take someone else's work? Uh, an exercise I do when I go into the classroom to, to talk to students is I ask them to put the most valuable item they have with them. And it's always surprising to see when somebody puts a car keys <laughs> on the table, I'm like, wow, okay. <laughs> um, so I will take the car keys and I'll walk back to the front. And then I'll say, you know, thank you very much for the car keys. These keys belong to such and such a person. I may donate these to a, a good cause. And, and then I ask them to tell me how it felt when I took that away from them. And they invariably will say, it made me angry because I worked for it, it was my car, it was, what, it was my thing. And I said, well, that is the component here that you also have to realize is when you take something from somebody else, even if you think you give them credit for it, or even if you think you're doing it for a good cause, it still has that potential impact of the fact that you are stealing from someone else. So it's that part of it. Yes, yeah, back here. I just had a uh, question on if you had any um, definitions as far as permissions go. Um, I've had a couple of opportunities where we requested permission, but we don't really hear anything back. And and, and a couple of people had said, that, well, if, if you ask for permission and you don't hear it back, that's acknowledging that you have permission. And I don't know if that's so true, but for instance, like uh, there's some news organizations in, in Burlington that we've used snippets from their program and um, you know, or if I posted it on a website, if they came to our school and did a, mm -hmm. a, a, a uh, news piece about our school, and if I posted it on my web page, I've, I've sent, we use permission to use that. But and many times I've, I have not received information back as to yes. And, and how, how long do you wait? Or is there, is, you know, I, I don't know exactly. The permission sounds great. We'll go look for permission, which we've done, but we never really seem to get. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> Okay, so, so okay. you're not, you're not gonna uh, like the answer. Yeah. <laughs> you're not gonna no. like the answer. I would say don't use it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and the reason I say that is because it could be that there's no problem at all. But why take that risk? Mm -hmm. Let me also say something that, that I feel should be the very first thing you talk, think about before you actually create a project. Who's, where is this going to be put? Who's my audience? If I'm using it in the classroom, or if I'm using it for my personal use, there are different thresholds in which you probably need to think about copyright. Once you start thinking it's going outside of your own home or outside of your own classroom and it gets on YouTube or it gets into television at RITN, the standards or the threshold that you have to be careful about becomes, and the reality becomes much higher. And as I mentioned earlier, RITN probably has a little bit bigger budget, household budget, than somebody individually here does. So are they going to come after you? Probably not, although, remember a few years ago, Napster and some of those things where they went after individuals? So they do go after individuals, but, um, but the chances are they're going to come after the company more, which is why we have to be extra careful. But, but I'm just saying this because I think if you think about what you, where it's going, and if it's just something you're doing for yourself personally, not getting the permission may not be as critical. I will never say publicly that you should never seek permission or go ahead and use something where you don't have permission, but I'll say it may be less critical for you to do it. But once you start breaking those other barriers, those thresholds, um, I, I absolutely would avoid well, using it something. It certainly seems like you you tried to make an attempt, and you're acting in good faith to, to, you know. It, it, it could certainly help you in your defense. That, right? In your defense. It's not like but do you want to get to that point? Well, you have to process, get. To <laughs> but do you want? I mean, and oftentimes you'll get a cease and desist letter before you actually go to court. But my point is. If you can avoid it, especially when working with kids, why model behavior that says it's okay to use something without someone's permission? That's, that's just the ethical, moral side of it that I kind of come from. But it's, And it goes back to the thing with Disney. I'm sure those daycares had no clue that putting those images up, I'm sure they probably didn't ask, 
and who would have thought? So. And, and I think that's actually, I thought somebody would raise a question about that particular story. There is more to that story, as oftentimes is the case with the coffee yeah. cup, mug, ugh, hot water. Um, from what I understand, the daycare centers had put it on their outside walls, five foot high signs, which violated the city's ordinance for signs. Mm. The city was concerned about it. They were considering taking action, but then conveniently, Disney intervened and, and, and because, and, and let's, you know, Disney is thought of as the big corporation bad guy, but let's be fair. It's their copyright, it's their product. If they let this daycare do it, then how are they going to go to another company and say, you can't do it? And they're very diligent about making sure that people aren't violating their copyright. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're very diligent. they are. So, and, and just like anyone who is trying to make money would do. I mean, in, in other words, they created this content. So the one thing that may have not come through as clearly either is the fact that it is copyright that allows people to be creative because you know you can make money on something that you create. The, the assumption is you can do that. That's why it was established. Mm -hmm. So imagine if, if uh, Disney wasn't able to have copyright protection. All these wonderful movies that kids love would probably never be created. So, I mean, there's just many sides to these things. Oftentimes we like to paint the big corporations as bad people, the big guys and the little guys. Um, that little guy right. was trying to protect his right as well. And I bring that up to the kids in the classroom. You know how when students are drawing something and then the kid sitting next to them likes their idea yeah. and they take it? And kids get very protective about that. That was my idea first. Mm -hmm. And so I bring those conversations up with them to let them kind of make that leap towards why the copyright. So if, as long as you know that it was your idea first and the teacher knew that was your idea first, are you okay that this other kid kind of is building upon your idea? Yeah, sure. You know, But they want their credit. So they understand that when you bring it back to their world. So we had a question. Yeah, Are you familiar with the, um, the the film that was made by a professor at Stanford, Eric? I can't fair remember his last. The fair use, fair use tale. Yeah. Um, I, I'm Disney, not familiar, but, uh, and yeah. it's a little oh, seconds yes, of yes, 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 yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I mean, there, there are some very creative parodies and yes. or um, ways that you can use legitimately use copyrighted material, but once again, under the four part test, I would suggest going and looking at the ways that they recommend. But, but the point, once again, I think you were asking, we've talked about the 30 seconds, and then we also talked about not getting permission. Yeah. So the problem is, there is a, there is a, uh, a part of the four-part test that says if, if you can't find permission, I believe, if, if, the, if it's not, if you can't find who the copyright holder is, there is a component, but that's only one part of the four-part test, once again. So I think you have to, to keep thinking in your mind, I need to get as many parts of that four-part test met, and I need to show that I've tried to do all four parts of it. It's then if you get sued, you have some sense of d due diligence. So you know, one last question. Mm -hmm. Now, in, the, in derivative usage, um, mm -hmm. now I, I would think that you know, like, you know, a parody, I mean, I, I don't know how you're talking about parody. It's just you know, your own production of something else. Or can you use the original in that parody? And that would be the derivative usage. Oh, absolutely. There is a website. Um, that is American University, I believe. And let me see if I can quickly tab to it. It's on our website, on the fair use, uh, on copyright, on the copyright part, retn.org. There is a uh, expert to share top five examples of videos they think fall under fair use. It is actually a really interesting site because they take parodies, they take all kinds of fair use examples. So it's American University, I believe, uh, Center for Social Media. And definitely, if you get a t chance to kind of check through that, and you'll see some pretty clever examples. So yes, they, they, they actually use real footage, they actually use real music, you know, copyrighted stuff. But w as long as it fits into the category of parody, or um, th there are several other items they list there. And so that would also mean, like, if I wanted to go to the NASA site, or any other, you know, government organization site where I can uh, uh, use some video, I would be able to take that video, maybe throw it into Premiere Pro and extract the audio from it and put my own audio in? Government yes. websites, yeah. you're able to take and use okay. it because it's in the public domain. And, and, okay. and I'd like to thank everybody. We would like to thank everybody for coming. And I just want to put in a big plug for RETN. Doug doesn't know I'm going to say this. But they are fabulous for working with schools, and they want our content out there. But, and so the more we can do, the more we can get out there, the more excited your kids will be. But RETN is great. And they're also offering, I'm just doing this, he doesn't yeah. even know, a class this summer, if you've seen these flying around. I am so excited to be able to take this class because it's really, once we get quick at making video, 
it really makes it productive for the classroom. It's not an extra chore, and these guys, RETN, are great about helping, so tap into them, they're awesome.